Good morning to all. Are there some here to, this morning that were not here last night? Well, then let me introduce myself again. I'm, my name is Edwin Noyes. I'm a retired physician. I spent my life in practice in a little town called Forest Grove in Oregon. It's about 25 miles due west of Portland. I was invited here by Olaf and Jane Batal. They attended one of the seminars I gave in Kelowna in June. And uh, at that time, they asked if I might find my way down to Spirit Lake. So that's why I'm here. The subject that we have as the general seminar is one that you probably have not heard much about. And that is the title we could say, Alternative and Mystical Healing Therapies. Are they medically sound and spiritually safe? That's a question. <clears throat> we hope to answer that to you today. And the program I present is one that builds one lecture upon another especially the first four. So it is important that uh, one has them in that sequence. Last night, we presented the story of our health message. And the reason I presented that, I wanted to contrast the story of the health message, the message that God had given us in health, and that those that have followed it down through the years have put the Seventh-day Adventist Church on a pedestal among the scientific community today. For a long period, it was just the opposite. But today it's recognized as having had the correct understanding of lifestyle and uh, the uh, nutrition especially. That fits because we wanted to look at what God has given a people. And then we're looking in this afternoon especially at a, a counterfeit system. God's message of health was the, said to be the right arm of the message, an entering wedge. The devil has a health message also, and it also is an entering wedge, and it has been extremely successful. It's not been recognized by many, and so my purpose is to share with you the understanding I gained in this uh, exposing the counterfeit, I gained it because I needed to have answers for myself. I did not really understand when these things first began to be coming up on the scene. Primarily in 19, early 1970s, 75 and thereafter. If you remember, President Nixon went to China. When he came back, the reporters that went with him were reporting about acupuncture, how they saw surgery there ongoing. The anesthesia was acupuncture. And the person wide awake having the surgery, uh, eating an apple, while they were operating on the abdomen or on the chest. Well, that initiated a great interest among the public in the United States. And most every doctor was faced with the question, tell me about it, what do you know? And none of us knew anything. And so what answers do you get? The first thoughts I had, it's hypnotism, which I still believe, but I didn't have proof. And through the years, for 20 years, I kept looking for answers. And I began to say, maybe there really is something here. But the moment I would just knew that if I put my voice out and said, well, expose it to be something else, they would sh the scientists would show how it physiologically really did work, and then I would have egg all over my face. Now, every other doctor had pretty much the same feeling, those that were suspicious of it. But as time went along, after 20-some years of waiting for the scientists to show how it worked, I said, you know, I can't wait forever. I th and I had been studying and re researching this subject. I didn't find anybody practicing physicians or ministers that really, really understood it. And then I found a little book that came my way that exposed 
the foundation. And after that, it all fell into place. And we'll get into that this afternoon. But this morning, I want to now look at what the Bible has to tell us about certain things. The key that was in this little book we'll be dealing with at the 11 o'clock hour. I will share that with you. Now, what I bring to you, I don't come with the idea that that's it, you have to take it. I will share with you what I have learned to understand from my studying. You do with it as you please. But I will tell you it has been reviewed by people that have been deep, deep into this occultic life, and I have yet to find one that said that there was error in what I present. So I have confidence after 20 years of doing this that it is correct, but it will be new to most of you. Let's look this morning. You remember this verse, you shall have no other gods before me, the first commandment. Remember the first four are having to do with our relationship to God. The last six of the commandments, relationship between one another. But this commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And we're dealing with a subject that is a, actually bringing other gods before him. So, let's go forward. Israel had been 40 years in the desert, and now it was, now it was time that they were to come to the promised land, to cross the Jordan. Moses was giving advice to them before they were to cross. And the book of Deuteronomy contains the advice that Moses repeatedly gave to those people. And we look now at Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 through 28. And Moses was saying, look, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, which I command you today. And the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord our God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today, to go after other gods which you have not known. So here we have Moses facing these people and saying, look, there's the land we're going to go to. You will be blessed if you will follow the commands that God has given you, the instructions, the guidance that he has blessed you with. But you're going to receive a curse if you ignore those blessings. We look at Deuteronomy 12, verse 2 and 3. You, and this instructions God gave to the children of Israel as they were getting ready to go across the Jordan into the promised land. And here we have, you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods. They were to destroy any place on the high mountains, on the hills, and under every green tree. You shall destroy their altars, break their sacred pillars, burn their wooden images, burn them with fire, you shall cut down the carved images of their gods and destroy their names from that place. Even the names of these places of worship were to be destroyed and not used. This is important to remember because sometimes we have some of the activities we're going to talk about this afternoon call it Christian this, Christian that. But here we have advice that very name is to be dealt with. Pretty important. Let us continue. <clears throat> Go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9 through 14. Now, again, this information, just before they were to go across the Jordan, in some very direct directions at this point. When you come into the land which the Lord our God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. You see, they would have them run through coals of fire on their feet. If they were burned, then they felt that person was not blessed by the gods and would be used as a sacrifice. You'll find this comment in Patriarchs and Prophets. 
There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Now in these verses, it looks like every type of occultic activity was attempted to be named. But yet there's more to come. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the, your, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. Ye shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listen to soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. They will be clear of these. These were Satan's methods of controlling people. And the people were to look to the God, not to have any other gods before them. They were to look to the Creator God. We look in the book of Daniel, and when Daniel had been given the dream that Nebuchadnezzar could not remember, Daniel pointed out to the great king some pretty pertinent facts. He pointed out to him that the people that practiced these things we were talking about had no power, they had no, no accuracy. The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. They're not able to do it. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets. A very important point to, to realize that here was a kingdom, and the king Nebuchadnezzar de, uh, relied upon these individuals that pretended or felt they could give the king wisdom and advice. But Daniel pointed out they weren't able to bring back that dream, but the God of heaven can. And today we want to look to the God of heaven, the creator God that we serve, to be the source of our information. Now I want to review just a few points that we did last night. In 1848 was the first vision given relevant to health that was given to the those small group of people that were studying and searching to know God's will after the great disappointment. And that this health message was to be the right arm of the message, an entering wedge. It was a part of the three angels' message, like the hand is with the arm. And it was to be in harmony with God's physical laws. This is an important point to, re to put down in your memory. God's method of health and healing is in harmony with his physical and chemical laws, the laws of the universe. We are going to be contrasting that with a system that doesn't depend upon those laws, that's not connected to them. Now, that message which was given to this people down through time, that's especially on nutrition, was rejected by science until recent years. And now they say, how did you know this? How did you know? I had a doctor ask me that. I didn't get to answer him because another doctor standing there with heavy prejudice gave him his answers. <laughs> and I just let it drop. Proved to be the health guide. The one that God gave us has proven to be very successful. Those people that have followed it, even partially, have shined out and have been shown to be the longer lived in life. But what's more important than how long we live is how we think while we're living. And this message God gave is designed to give us the best brain ability and the best attitude and disposition and emotions. This is a very important part of the health message to realize its real purpose so that I might then choose to select and be, have the faith and confidence in the merits of the shed blood of Christ to give me life eternal. Looking a bit at that term alternative and mystical healing, this subject may be yet in your mind, look, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about acupuncture, yoga, 
a whole variety of there's scores of these particular things. But to, so you can kind of zero in on your mind on what we're aiming for in this afternoon. They are not found to be in harmony with God's physical laws. Their origin is out of the pagan pantheistic doctrine. And we'll be showing that in the next session. They, it is the right arm of the neo-pagan movement. Today we call them progressives. The health message is, was the right arm. It's been very successful. There is a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy, which is sort of the, uh, uh, you might say, the workbook or the manifesto book for the New Age movement, the progressive movement, written in 1980. And in there, they come right out and say these things are the most effective in changing the world view of people to do, deal with the uh, healing mechanisms are the most effective to bring people into this movement. So it isn't my words. I'm quoting now from the book Aquarian Conspiracy. Unfortunately, we as a people looking for natural ways of healing have uh, from time to time been deceived. And this very message, the right arm of the devil's message has moved right into the church. I have yet to visit a place that I haven't found that as unbeknown to the people what they're doing, but have accepted some of those philosophies. And so my purpose, good morning, Gwen, welcome. This is the lady responsible for me writing a book. All right, come right in. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at what we have here on the board here. Not a few in this Christian age and the Christian nation resort to evil spirits. Could that be me? Boy, I was tempted at a time in my, when this type of thing began to show up in the 70s to look at it a little caref carefully for use, but I chose not to use it. Not a few in this Christian age and Christian nation resort to evil spirits rather than trust to the power of the living God. We're talking today about a subject that means eternal life versus eternal death. It's that important. And we'll point that out by Bible verses shortly. Rather than trusting in the living God, the mother, watching by the sick bed of her child, exclaims, I can do no more. Is there no physician who has power to restore my child? She's told of the wonderful cures performed by some clairvoyant or magnetic healer. And she trusts her dear one to his charge, placing it as verily in the hands of Satan as if he were standing by her side. In the many instances, the future life of the child is controlled by a satanic power, which it seems impossible to break. These are rather serious um, subjects that we are looking at. Revelation 22, verse 14 and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. But outside, outside the new Jerusalem, outside its gates, are dogs and sorcerers. The New International Version says those who do magic arts and whoremongers, and murderers, and adulterers, and whoever, whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Why are they outside the gates? For by their sorceries were all nations deceived. The word sorceries uh, used by Ellen White will cover all of the subject that we are speaking on today. Some people may look in Revelation and say, well, the original Greek is pharmakia, or pharmakios. There's three different... Uh, versions of that, which means enchantment with drugs. The enchantment of using the drugs, which of course our day is very prominent. But it also covers all of the other variety of things we read about there in Deuteronomy, that when they were to go into that land, they weren't to deal with the soothsayers, the diviners, and so forth. So, for by their sorceries were all nations deceived, neither repented they of their murders, 
nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So they didn't repent. They continued to use them and believe in them. And what happens in the end? They were outside the gates. Sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, the final death. So it's a rather important subject. Let's look at two great spiritualistic deceptions, which is our title for the morning presentation. What do I mean by two spiritualistic deceptions? We go down to the Garden of Eden, and God had created, the Bible tells us, the first day, certain creation, the second day, third day, and so forth, and after each day, the expression, and God saw that it was good. At the end of the Sixth day, God saw that it was very good. I wondered what day, one day, what, why was that expression used in the Bible? What did it really mean? We had, a, I had heard it all my life, didn't give it a thought, so I looked up in the dictionary. What does good mean? Well, I had a whole list of variety of things. But the one that attracted my attention was this one good, to be in harmony with the moral order of the universe. And then I said, what does that mean? <laughs> you know how one question's answer leads you to another one. And then as I was reading the book, Desire of Ages, page 20, 21, it tells me what the harmony of the universe was. There's one word that can cover it, or one expression, God's love, the love of God. But in this, the ecology of the universe was the love of others. Everything for others, not for self. The core issue of God's ecology of the universe, and which is love, is doing well for others, everything for others, not that selfishness that marred his perfect place of paradise. Let's look at this. This comes from Desire of Ages, page 20 and 21, I believe. The law of love, the great law of the universe, God gave to the Son, who gave to the created, who in turn returns the love and gives back to the Son, who in turn gives to the Father, the great circle of beneficence, it is called. This was the harmony of the universe. What happened? Well, there was a great created being in heaven that let some strange feeling come to his heart, and it changed him, as you see there. And this law of beneficence was now broken because rather than for the created beings to give their love back to the Son, who in turn would give to the Father, Lucifer in deception was having them give their love to him. And he continues to do that. And the things we'll be talking about this afternoon are, is another way by which he breaks that circle. And we think we're doing something, quotes, natural and good and God-given, and we're actually paying homage to the great deceiver. Let's look at the principles that occurred at the tree. This tree was called, you remember, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't just that there was good and there was now evil, selfishness. This knowledge is referring to what the devil does with this down through the ages, including today. The blending of good and evil to be a superior system is his object and his teaching. Now, Eve was not to go near that tree. Her angel wouldn't go with her, and she was on her own. She felt she was strong enough. She understood things. She could manage. You read Patriarchs and Prophets. She felt confident that she could manage, but she couldn't. There was a medium there. The serpent was the medium of the devil. He didn't come in his 
form that she anticipated, and he has thousands of mediums that he can approach us by when we not recognize, unless we're thinking and listen to the message. Then she uh, did a little parling back and forth with him. Now that put her definitely in a losing situation. And how often we do that. Well, I can't see any harm in this. And we set our mind before we really know what we're speaking on. And then a little error with a lot of truth. Very deceptive. And today we're faced with that. And then the question was asked, what did God say? Well, she says, we'll die if we partake of this fruit or if I pick this fruit. And of course, you know this, the devil says, you won't die. And upon that base became spiritualism. Spiritualism, the dictionary says, is the belief of being able to connect with the dead, to communicate with the dead. But it has even more than that. And we'll get to some of the more extended definition here in a little while. Now, all of us have remembered that, but what we have not dwelt upon much in the years gone by is that other part that the devil says, if you partake of this fruit, you will become wise, you will gain wisdom, you will progress to actual godhood. You'll have the wisdom of God. And this is the point that the New Age and the New Age alternative therapies are built upon. So we're dealing now with the foundation principles from which the devil has dealt deception to the world for 6,000 years. And we're told at the end of time he will bring it to the highest level he's ever had of deception. And I think we're there. I expect a little more deception yet, but uh, we're pretty well there. Let's look at the signs of the times. May 29, 1901, part two. He approached Eve not in the form of an angel, but as a serpent, subtle, cunning, and deceitful. With a voice that appeared to proceed from the serpent, he spoke to her, and his conversation was like the words which today the wise and wicked angels speak through various agencies. Let me read that last phrase again. His conversation was like the words which today wise and wicked angels speak through various agencies. As Eve listened, the warnings that God had given faded from her mind. She yielded to the temptation as she tempted Adam. He also forgot God's warnings. He believed the words of the enemy of God. Now here's a little diagram I spoke of a book I found that helped me understand, written by Ernest Steed, and this comes out of Ernest Steed's book. I was able, before his death, to contact him, get permission to use this. But it explained so much to me, and I thought you would find it helpful too. Now, God uh, had his system, but Lucifer comes along, he says, your law and your system is, needs a little tweaking. It's not quite good. The angels shouldn't have to be under law and be under obedience. And we need a little tweaking of your system. And that tweaking was a little self, selfishness. So now you have selflessness as a start, God's ecology. And now is introduced selfishness, which destroys it. And he says, you put them together, good plus evil, and you have a superior system. Did it turn out that way? At the cross of Calvary, love, Jesus hanging on the cross, the love of God, giving his son, came face to face with selfishness. See how important that realize what the subject of self means. Let's go down to old Babylon after the flood. It was the cradle of the oriental civilization. It was the cradle of the pagan religions. It from there spread out to all parts of the world. A counterfeit system of God's plan of salvation. Pagan religions means nature worship. Spirit Prophecy tells us nature worship was what God, what Satan had led the people to follow before the flood. It was so successful then that God destroyed the earth. Why not use the same again? 
And that's what we're back into, and it's called, we refer to it as paganism, but nature worship. And it had its origin again out of the ancient Babylon, long before Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. And these, when the Tower of Babel had the language dis changes, this basic counterfeit religion of, spread to the world. And it was Satan that had started this religion. It mimicked God's plan of salvation, had a trinity, had a sacrifice, had a looking for a coming savior. All of these things down through time that all the pagan religions had as their foundation base this counterfeit of God's plan of salvation. And what we have now coming back through, sweeping through us, is the end results of it in health and healing. This is the, I'm not so much interested in helping you see, well, acupuncture or this or that, the other bad. I want you to see the whole picture. The devil's counterfeit, how he's affecting and how strong it has moved into our church. Satan's theology is man possesses all knowledge and wisdom of the universe. What did he say at the garden? You will progress to Godhood, have this knowledge. And we only need to learn how to get this, it's all in us, how do we get it out? And the fruit from the tree in the garden was the first modality offered by Satan to bring about the full potential of man. What is that full potential? His Godhood. Do not be deceived. So we go to Matthew 24 and the disciples ask Jesus, what is going to be the signs at the end of time? And what does he say? He talks about deception. Tremendous deception. Take heed, no man deceive you. Verse 5, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Verse 11, and many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. Verse 23, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Paul writing to Timothy says, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith. Doing what? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Are we there? We're in the latter times. Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14. Remember, we have the plagues. The sixth plague, prior to the sixth plague, we have this statement, and I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great, great day of God Almighty. Now it says there will be spirits of demons in the last days going out doing miracles. And elsewhere we have where there will be healings. In 20 years of presenting seminars on this subject, I have run into one basic opposition. Well, it worked. It, I feel better. It works. So that proves it's of God. That's the one thing I run into. Now, if you have a miracle by the devil, and I, you get well from something, that proves that it was of God. So what happens if you utilize some of these things, if you do better, you cannot use in determining whether this is God or whether it's a false. Because the devil can put illness on you and he can relieve it. And we're told he does this many, many times. And oh, so what I did got well and now I want to preach it to the world. This is the cure for this. And we're told that this is done again and again. We're also told these tests will bring the Seventh-day Adventists to the test. There's those very, we'll see those verses later. But to realize that miracles, you cannot use those as a guide. There's a section in section. Uh, the book, second book of Selected Messages, page 48 to 54. That is, are miracles signs of a favor of God's favor? And the answer is no. You cannot use them that. There are other measures we have to use. We use the scriptures to determine. Spirits working miracles. Now here, I mentioned to you, I was going to point out some variety of things that come under the heading of spiritualism. 
It's not all sitting around the table in a seance and the table jumping up and down and some materialization of a ghost. No, it's accepting even concepts, beliefs, puts in, can be under that heading. And this I took from the 34th chapter of the Great Controversy, these quotations. Man is a creature of the progression onto Godhood. We've been talking about that. Each mind judges itself. The judgment will be right. There's no error, there's no sin because you judge yourself. The throne is within self. These are verses, phrases I took out of this chapter. All are unfallen demigods, little gods. There is divinity within. Any just and perfect being is Christ. Life continues after the death of the body. Reincarnation, coming back. I read the other day around 60 some percent of people in the United States now believe in reincarnation. Communication possible with the deceased and talking in tongues. God does not condemn. So when you think about these thoughts, let's say we be, the majority of Protestantism and Catholicism believes people go directly to heaven at death. That puts them in a belief of spiritualism under these definitions. You can see how spiritualism can be so widespread. We're told that it'll cover everyone on the earth except those that are deeply connected with the scriptures. So deceptive that all on earth will be under this heading of spiritualism at that time. And you can see why. When you look at these particular concepts that are a part that's going about today and being propagated uh, rapidly. The Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the Gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. Now, where's the organization of spiritualism that they're going to grasp the hands with? Is there one out there today? Have you heard about any one called spiritualism by its name, title, an organization? No, there was back in 1900. 10% of the United States around 1900 were involved in an organization of, of spiritualism at that time. But now we don't. But how can this be then if the Protestants reach over and grasp the hands of spiritualism? They incorporate those things into their beliefs that we've just talked about. That's how they grasp it. And then what do they do? Then they join with the Roman power that fits right into that. And under this influence, the threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the rights of conscience. So it's happening today. This amalgamation. How is it being done? Well, everything that seems like out there on earth is propagating this concepts. The mass, me the mass media, education. Why, in the schools now, even down in kindergartens, they're teaching them to do the Eastern meditations. Mindfulness meditation, which is nothing but Buddhism. Channeling the connecting with the spirits. The different movies promote these things. The games, comics, comic books, environmental movement is involved in this. Health and healing, which we're speaking on here, and other as well. Now here's this book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, which would be kind of like the, the New York Times called it the New Age Bible, that outlines their purpose, written in 1980, outlining their purpose how they're going about it and doing it, and it's marching right on exactly as outlined there. And in there, they said, these healing mechanisms that we, people get involved with are the best way to bring people's worldview toward that of the Eastern worldview, which we'll learn more about that a little later. And so there are points of entry into this thinking. And here it comes out of that book, these particular... Um, Outline showing the variety of things that there are. Let's read a few of those, maybe. It can't take time to read all of them. The yoga, astrology, psychic readings, tarot cards, uh, the pendulum using divination methods, uh, transcendental meditation, guided imagery, Ouija board, cult, sim cult symbols, so forth. Multitudes. The book says, I think, thousand thousand ways 
And so here we have from Great Controversy 588, as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and to ensnare. Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought. Not fake ones, but miracles. The sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. I told a story last night to those that were here about um, some divination that was done that some members of a large Adventist church in Portland, these uh, gentlemen were going to correct me in my writings in my book and so forth. And I won't go into too, too much detail because I want to do it this afternoon again. But because a certain thing where they were looking for water on the land and what they had done, they found water when they drilled. They, they knew it was of the Lord. They had sent it a plot of plot of their land across the state to have somebody douse it with a pendulum and mark the spot and they drilled and that was they prayed on it first and that proved it was from the Lord. False revival. Paul in his second letter to the Thessalonians points to the special working of Satan in spiritualism as an event to take place immediately before the second advent of Christ. Speaking of Christ's second coming, he declares that it is after the working of Satan with all power and lying wonders. We go back to those verses in Revelation 16. They are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Remember, there's going to be two groups of people at the end of time. One group is the one that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. The other group is the rest of the world. And we're told the whole world will be led by spiritualism. Except for those that are deeply grounded in the scriptures. That's out of great controversy. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. People are fast being lulled to a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. Now sometimes in these meetings as we come to a subject that an individual has believed in and maybe practiced or had confidence in, and then it's a bit irritating to them to have somebody stand up there and say that, well, this is of the devil that which they've been involved in. That's just not nice to do that. It's not well accepted. But let me say that I had to change some of my beliefs as I studied and learned these things. I had to change from some of those that are popular. I had a question in my mind, never totally sound accepted them, but had moved quite a bit that way. And so what I bring to you, I hope, can be taken and you use and look at and decide, is this true or not? I'm simply sharing what I learned. I sought this for my answers to myself. Never dreamed when I started searching that I'd ever be in front of a people presenting or write books about it. That was furthest from my mind. And this lady convinced me to write a book. It's her fault. <laughs> I don't know if you know her, Gwen Shorter. And she lived in New York then, didn't you? And then moved to Los Angeles. Now you're fortunate to have her at uh, Priest River. Down there. All right. The last day events, the last great delusion is soon to open before us. Antichrist is to perform his marvelous works in our sight. So closely will the counterfeit resemble the true that it will be impossible to distinguish between them except by the Holy Scriptures. So let's take something here. Let's, let's take acupuncture, very commonly known about. How do you test it by the scriptures? Anybody want to try that? Doesn't mention it. The whole Bible doesn't have a word about acupuncture or acupressure or that. How do you test it by the scriptures? 
Well, what we give today, I think, will help you. You have to look at the foundation. What did it come out of? What is it its explanation for how it works? And this is how you will deal with these. Let's take yoga, the Christian yoga. And we'll be looking this afternoon at that. And this is how from the scriptures, we, we know from the scriptures God's methods. And then he warns us and tells us about the great deceiver. And his spiritualism will cover the world. And these demons come out like frogs out of the mouth. We know that's out there. We need to have some curiosity when we see new things tested by the scriptures. So you go back and you look at this history. And uh, another thing I put forth at this point, these healing methods that are being used and propagated are coming from societies that have millennia of a history of abominable health conditions. Didn't seem to do them any good. And now it's coming through the country with the highest science in the world, in the field of medicine, it's coming through like an answer to prayer, people accepting it, but it has no history scientifically of benefiting anybody in the long run. When you take the thousands, they look at the, and have done these tests. Two billion dollars have been spent by the United States government studying these things and can't show how they work physiologically. Two billion dollars, and that was some year, ten years ago, on the testing. And what they have found, that they work by placebo. What does that mean? Our mind over matter. That is such a powerful thing. And people can't realize that. Sure, people did, uh, took a treatment, oh, now I'm well and I was hurting beforehand. But when they take thousands of them, look at them over years, they cannot find any really benefit other than the placebo effect. Let's see, did we finish that? Okay, every testimony, a statement, every miracle tested by the scriptures. The sciences of phrenology, the psychology, and mesmerism had been the channel through which Satan has worked in the late 1800s and the 1900s. So let's look just briefly there, because back in the days of Ellen White, she says, here's the basic health measures that are involved in spiritualism in my day. Phrenology, and you probably say, well, what's that? We'll show you in a moment. Psychology, you've heard of that. And the um, psychology was just kind of coming into its being in the very late 1890s and early 1900s. It had been philosophy primarily before that down through the decades and the centuries. And then the word psychology, which means the study of the soul, the science of the soul. And mesmerism, you're familiar with that word. At that time, it meant hypnotism. Mesmer was the doctor that at a particular period of time, made it popular, mesmerism. But actually, all the psychologists used um, hypnotism as well. Today, the same power is present, but under many different forms and practices. Messages to young people, 57. So let's give a little thought to this. What is phrenology? Back in the late 1890s, early 1900s, uh, a particular anatomist found that the brain, different sections of the brain, had different functions for the body as they were advancing in science. And then the be began the concept that certain places on the skull, if pressure was made, would affect um, certain spots or certain um, psychological defect in the person's personality or this, that, and the other. And to give treatment, then they designed what you see here, this hood that they put on and then they would screw the little pressure points down and make pressure points special places. They'd sit there with that and this would treat and supposedly correct their personality defects or other problems in the body. This is popular. Actually I read a book on the history of um, Kellogg or so and in Battle Creek, the students of Battle Creek College on Saturday nights, this book said they would uh, get together and practice phrenology on each other. Uh, this was very interesting. So this was in the 20s, probably, or teens there. Uh, well, it would be way before that. It would be early 1900s, yeah. So this is a practice that has come back into vogue. But the medical society never accepted it. 
Medical doctors at the time didn't skip. They had their own problems to get over. They didn't need a new one. And here's it gives you a little picture of the variety of potential problems and things on these different spots on the brain. But phrenology was common. Out of phrenology, we can trace some other things that uh, came, like perhaps the cranial sacral uh, uh, therapy followed suit from this. And here's the present day the uh, person getting treated. Psychology, it was a system of self. The basis of psychology is self, self-esteem, psychoanalysis, the collective unconsciousness of Freud and, and Jung. The human potential is godhood is what they speak about when they say you reach your human potential, your godhood. And Freud tells us that psychology was a means of delivering the world from religion. These are the basic people that gave the foundation for psychology. Carl Jung, who was in Switzerland, he was a spiritualist. He had a spirit guide. And in his 40s, he said it was the spirit guide that helped him formulate his philosophy for the mind. And those are the greatest influences on the field of psychology for the century following them on that part. And Mrs. Wright tells us these had the forerunners of spiritualism. And here is doing what they call a pass, doing hypnotism. Uh, they call it a pass, where they would wave their hands or so forth. And Dr. Mesmer, who graduated from Vienna Medical School in the late 1700s, made that popular. And we will look at that more later. But let's go to the Bible. We have reached the perils of the last days. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Be cautious in regard to what you read and how you hear. Take not a particle of interest in spiritualistic theories. Satan is waiting to steal a march upon everyone who allows himself to be deceived by his hypnotism. We're told at the tree he used hypnotism in the garden. He begins to exert his power over them just as soon as attention is given to his theories. So if we are looking at these things to utilize for ourselves, we start paying attention, immediately his influence can be allowed to be over us, according to this theory, this comment. So we come to the close of this particular presentation. This is an introduction to that which we will do at the 11 o'clock hour. Therein I want to go a little deeper into that part where we saw good plus, equal plus evil equals a superior system. Because we are suffering the ill effects of that being applied throughout our land and in our church. Not because people want to or perceive it, not realizing. I found myself not understanding this. And I couldn't find anybody that really understood it to explain it to me. But eventually when I did find this little book written by Ernest Steed, Ernest Steed was a general conference man for 25 years, head of the temperance department, traveled the world. His son, Eric Steed, is head of religious liberty of the General Conference now. And uh, Lincoln helped him write the little book. I've, I conversed with both of them on this. And it's the, the little key that unlocked this. I was invited to go to Russia in 19, uh, received the invitation in 1998. In 1999, I went with two other gentlemen, Dr. Walter Thompson, from chairman of the board of 3ABN, and Dr. Manny Vosquez, vice chairman, vice president, North American Division at that time. I was invited to take this seminar, the first one I'd given over there, because this subject was so much and so heavy in the churches of the Eurasian Division. And in, in this, I wonder how am I going to approach people, the health educators of all of the conferences of the whole division, 13 nations were coming together and I was to present, we were to present this subject. How are you going to deal with people that don't 
speak your language. They're doctors, physicians, nurses, pharmacists, educated people have been trained in these ways through their trainings in schools. It's motherhood to follow these things. How are you going to deal with them? You're going to have a big argument. But that which avoided that was going into the depth of the subject that we'll do in our 11 o'clock service. It worked. And it was a relief because I had great nervousness over what I was going to be facing. And uh, so today, I will close at this time, and let's stand and have prayer. Our Father, we are grateful, knowing that your presence has been here through the Holy Spirit. We have looked at these subjects, and we have asked for your guidance, for your enlightenment to our minds, to understand your will for us. We want to be in harmony with your will. And please forgive us if we have slipped at some point and not understood where we were. We know we are forgiven as we ask. And today now, bless each one here. May our memories be good and clear that we may continue to be your servants and you be our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.